the pit and the pendulum. Edgar Allan Poe. I was sick, sick unto death with that long agony. And when they had length unbound me, and I was permitted to sit, I felt that my senses were leaving me. The sentence, the dread sentence of death, was the last of distinct accentuation which reached my ear. After that, the sound of the inquisitional voices seemed merged in one dreamy, indeterminate hum. This only for a brief period, for presently I heard no more. Yet for a while I saw, but with how terrible an exaggeration I saw the lips of the black-robed judges. I saw that the degrees of what to me was fate were still issuing from those lips. I saw them writhe with a deadly locution. I saw them fashion the syllables of my name, and I shuddered, because no sound succeeded. And then my vision fell upon the seven tall candles upon the table. At first they wore the aspect of charity, and seemed white and slender angels who would save me. But then, all at once, there came a most deadly nausea over my spirit, and I felt every fiber in my frame thrill as if I had touched the wire of a galvanic battery, while the angel forms became meaningless specters with heads of flame. And I saw that from them there would be no help, and then there stole into my fancy, like a rich musical note, the thought of that sweet rest there must be in the grave. All sensations appeared swallowed up in a mad, rushing descent, as of the soul into Hades. Then silence, stillness, night for the universe. I had swooned, but still will not say that all of consciousness was lost. What of it there remained I will not attempt to define or even to describe. Yet all was not lost. He who has never swooned is not he who finds strange places and wildly familiar faces and coals that glow, is not he who beholds floating in mid-air the sad visions that the many may not view, is not he who ponders over the perfume of some novel flower, is not he whose brain grows bewildered with the meaning of some musical cadence which has never before arrested his attention. Very suddenly there came back to my soul, motion and sound, the tumultuous motion of the heart, and in my ears the sound of its beating. Then a pause in which all is blank, then again sound and motion and touch, a tingling sensation pervading my frame. Then the mere consciousness of existence without thought, a condition which lasted long. Then very suddenly thought, and shuddering terror of their earnest endeavor to comprehend my true state, then a strong desire to lapse into insensibility, then a rushing revival of soul and a successful effort to move, and now a full memory of the trial, of the judges, of the sable draperies, of the sentence, of the sickness, of the swoon, then entire forgetfulness of all that followed, of all that a later day and much earnestness of endeavor have enabled me vaguely to recall. So far I had not opened my eyes. I felt that I lay upon my back, unbound. I reached out my hand, and it fell heavily upon something damp and hard. There I suffered it to remain for many minutes, while I strove to imagine where and what it could be. I longed, yet dared not to employ my vision. I dreaded the first glance at objects around me. It was not that I feared to look upon things horrible, but that I grew aghast lest there should be nothing to see. At length, with a wild desperation at heart, I quickly unclosed my eyes. My worst thoughts then were confirmed. The blackness of eternal night encompassed me. I struggled for breath, 
The intensity of the darkness seemed to oppress and stifle me. The atmosphere was intolerably close. I still lay quietly and made effort to exercise my reason. I brought to mind the inquisitional proceedings and attempted from that point to deduce my real condition. The sentence had passed, and it appeared to me that a very long interval of time had since elapsed. Yet not for a moment did I suppose myself actually dead. But where and in what state was I? A fearful idea now suddenly drove the blood and torrents upon my heart, and for a brief period I once more relapsed into insensibility. Upon recovering, I at once started to my feet. Trembling convulsively in every fiber, I thrust my arms wildly above and around me in all directions. I felt nothing, yet dreaded to move a step, lest I should be impeded by the walls of a tomb. Perspiration burst from my every pore, and stood in cold, big beads upon my forehead. The agony of suspense grew at length intolerable, and I cautiously moved forward, with my arms extended and my eyes straining from their sockets, in the hope of catching some faint ray of light. I proceeded for many paces, but still all was blackness and vacancy. I breathed more freely. It seemed evident that mine was not at least the most hideous of fates. And now, as I still continued to step cautiously onward, there came thronging upon my recollection a thousand vague rumors of the horrors of Toledo. Of the dungeons there had been strange things narrated, fables. I had always deemed them but yet strange, and too ghastly to repeat save in a whisper. Was I left to perish of starvation in this subterranean world of darkness? Or what fate, perhaps even more fearful awaited me. That the result would be death, and a death of more than customary bitterness. I knew too well the character of my judges to doubt. The mode and the hour were all that occupied or distracted me. My outstretched hands at length encountered some solid obstruction. It was a wall, seemingly of stone masonry, very smooth, slimy, and cold. I followed it up, stepping with all the careful distrust with which certain antique narratives had inspired me. The ground was moist and slippery. I staggered onward for some time, then I stumbled and fell. My excessive fatigue induced me to remain prostrate, and sleep soon overtook me as I lay. Upon awakening and stretching forth an arm, I found beside me a loaf and a pitcher with water. I was too much exhausted to reflect upon this circumstance, but ate and drank with avidly. I had met, however, with many angles in the wall, and thus I could form no guess as to the shape of the vault, for vault I could not help supposing it to be. Quitting the wall, I resolved to cross the area of the enclosure. At first I proceeded with extreme caution, for the floor, although seemingly of solid material, was treacherous with slime. At length, however, I took courage and did not hesitate to step firmly, endeavoring to cross in as a direct line as possible. I had advanced some ten or twelve paces in this manner, when the remnant of the torn hem of my robe became entangled between my legs. I stepped on it and fell violently on my face. In the confusion attending my fall, I did not immediately apprehend a somewhat startling circumstance, which yet, in a few seconds afterwards, and while I still lay prostrate, arrested my attention. It was this. My chin rested upon the floor of the prison, but my lips and the upper portion of my head, although seemingly at a less elevation than the chin, touched nothing. At the same time, my forehead seemed bathed in a clammy vapor, and the peculiar smell of decayed fungus arose to my nostrils. I put forward my arm and shuddered to find that I had fallen at the very brink of a circular pit, whose extent, of course, I had no means of ascertaining at the moment. 
Groping about the masonry just below the margin, I succeeded in dislodging a small fragment and let it fall into the abyss. For many seconds I hearkened to its reverberations as it dashed against the sides of the chasm in its descent. At length there was a sullen plunge into water, succeeded by loud echoes. At the same moment there came a sound resembling the quick opening as a rapid closing of a door overhead, while a faint gleam of light flashed suddenly through the door and a sudden faded away. I saw clearly the doom which had been prepared for me, and congratulated myself upon the timely accident by which I had escaped. Another step forward before my fall and the world had seen me no more, and the death just avoided was of that very character which I had regarded as fabulous and frivolous in the tales respecting the Inquisition. To the victims of its tyranny, there was the choice of death with its direst physical agonies or death with its most hideous moral horrors. I had been reserved for the latter. By long suffering, my nerves had been unstrung until I trembled at the sound of my own voice and had become in every respect a fitting subject for the species of torture which awaited me. Shaking in every limb, I broke my way back to the wall resolving there to perish rather than risk the terror of the wells, of which my imagination now pictured many in various positions about the dungeon. In other conditions of mind, I might have had courage to end my misery at once by a plunge into one of these abysses, but now I was the furriest of cowards. Neither could I forget that I had read of these pits, that the sudden extinction of life formed no part of their most horrible plan. Agitation of spirit kept me awake for many long hours, but at length I again slumbered. Upon arousing, I found by my side as before a loaf and a pitcher of water. A burning thirst consumed me, and I emptied the vessel in a draught. It must have been drugged, for scarcely had I drunk before I became irresistibly drowsy. A deep sleep fell upon me, a sleep like that of death. How long it lasted, of course, I know not. But when once again I unclosed my eyes, the objects around me were visible. By a wild sulfurous luster, the origin of which I could not at first determine, I was enabled to see the extent and aspect of the prison. The entire surface of this metallic enclosure was rudely daubed in all the hideous and repulsive devices to which the charnel superstition of the monks has given rise. The figures of fiends and aspects of manis, the skeleton forms, and other more really fearful images overspread and disfigured the walls. I now noticed the floor, too, which was of stone. In the center yawned the circular pit from whose jaws I had escaped, but it was the only one in the dungeon. All this I saw indistinctly and by much effort, for my personal condition had been greatly changed during slumber. I now lay upon my back and at full length on a species of low framework of wood. To this I was securely bound by a long strap resembling a surgical. It passed in many convolutions about my limbs and body, leaving at liberty only my head and my left arm to such extent that I could, by dint of much exertion, supply myself with food from an earthen dish which lay by my side on the floor. I saw to my horror that the picture had been removed. I say to my horror, for I was consumed with intolerable thirst. This thirst, it appeared to be the design of my persecutors to stimulate for the food in the dish was meat, ungently seasoned. Looking upward, I surveyed the ceiling of my prison. It was some thirty or forty feet overhead and constructed much as the side walls. In one of its panels, a very singular figure riveted my whole attention. It was the painted figure of time as he is commonly represented, save that in lieu of a sigh, he held what at a casual glance I supposed to be the pictured image of a huge pendulum, such as we see on antique clocks. 
There was something, however, in the appearance of this machine which caused me to regard it more attentively. While I gazed directly upward at it, for its position was immediately over my own, I fancied that I saw it in motion. In an instant afterward, the fancy was confirmed. Its sweep was brief, and of course slow. I watched it for some minutes, somewhat in fear, but more in wonder, wearied at length with observing its dull movement. I turned my eyes upon the other object in the cell. A slight noise attracted my notice. Looking to the floor, I saw several enormous rats traversing it. They had issued from the well, which lay within a view to my right. Even then, while I gazed, they came up in troops hurriedly, with ravenous eyes allured by the scent of the meat. From this, it required much effort and attention to scare them away. It might have been half an hour, or perhaps even an hour, for I could take but imperfect note of time before I again cast my eyes upward. What I then saw confounded and amazed me. The sweep of the pendulum had increased in extent by nearly a yard. As a natural consequence, its velocity also much greater. But what mainly disturbed me was the idea that had perceptibly descended. I now observed, with what horror, and is needless to say, that its neither extremity was formed of a crescent, glittering steel, about a foot in length from horn to horn, the horns upward, and the under edge evidently as keen as that of a razor. Like a razor also, it seemed massy and heavy, tapering from the edge into a solid and broad structure above. It was appended to a weighty rod of brass, and the whole hissed as it swung through the air. I could no longer doubt the doom prepared for me by monkish ingenuity and torture. My cognizance of the pit had become known to the inquisitional agents the pit whose horrors had been destined for so bold a resume as myself, the pit, typical of hell and regarded by rumor as the ultimate thule of all their punishments. The plunge into this pit I had avoided by the merest of accidents. I knew that surprise or entrapment into torment formed an important portion of all the grotesquerie of this dungeon death. Having failed to fall, it was no part of the demon plan to hurl me into the abyss, and thus, there being no alternative, a different and a milder destruction awaited me. Milder, I half smiled in my agony as I thought of such an application of such a term. What boots it to tell of the long, long hours of horror more than mortal during which I counted the rushing vibrations of the steel, inch by inch, line by line, with the descent only appreciable at intervals that seemed ages. Down and still down it came. <laughs>
been that many days past ere it swept so closely over me as to fan me. The acrid breath, the odor of the sharp steel forced itself into my nostrils. I prayed, I wearied heaven with my prayer for its more speedy descent. I frantically mad and struggled to force myself upward against the sweep of the fearful scanter. And then I fell suddenly calm, and lay smiling at the glittering death, as a child at some rare bauble. There was another interval of utter insensibility. It was brief, for upon again lapsing into life, there had been no perceptible descent in the pendulum. But it might have been long, for I knew there were demons who took note of my swoon, and who could have arrested the vibration at pleasure. Upon my recovery, too, I felt very home, inexpressibly sick and weak, as if through long inanition. Long suffering had nearly annihilated all my ordinary powers of mind. I was an imbecile. Idiot. The vibration of the pendulum was at right angles to my length. I saw that the crescent was designed to cross the region of my heart. It would fray the surge of my robe. It would return and repeat its operations again and again. Notwithstanding terrifically wide sweeps of thirty feet or more, and the its hissing vigor of its descent, sufficient to sunder these very walls of iron, still the fraying of my robe would not be all that for several minutes it would accomplish. And at this thought, I paused. I dared not go further than this reflection. I dwelt upon it with the pernacity of attention as if in so dwelling I could arrest here the descent of the steel. I forced myself to ponder upon the sound of the crescent as it should pass across the garment, upon the peculiar thrilling sensation which the friction of cloth produces on the nerves. I pondered upon all this frivolity until my teeth were on edge. Down, steadily down it crept, I took a frenzied pleasure in contrasting its downward with its lateral velocity, to the right, to the left, far and wide, with the shriek of a damned spirit, to my heart with the stealthy pace of the tiger. I alternately laughed and howled as the one or the other idea grew predominant. Down, certainly relentlessly down, it vibrated within three inches of my bosom. I struggled violently, furiously to free my left arm. This was free only from the elbow to the hand. I could reach the ladder from the platter beside me to my mouth with great effort, but no farther. Could I have broken the fastening above the elbow? I would have seized and attempted to arrest the pendulum. I might as well have attempted to arrest an avalanche. Down, still unceasingly, still inevitably down. I grasped and struggled at each vibration. I shrunk convulsively at every sweep. My eyes followed its outward or upward whirls with the eagerness of the most unseeming despair. They closed themselves spasmodically at the descent. Although death would have been a relief, oh, how unspeakable. Still I quivered in every nerve to think how slight a sinking of the machinery would precipitate that keen, glistening axe upon my bosom. I saw that some ten or twelve vibrations would bring the steel in actual contact with my robe, and with this observation there suddenly came over my spirit all the keen, collected calmness of despair. For the first time during many hours, or perhaps days, I thought, for many hours, the immediate vicinity of the low framework upon which I lay had been literally swarming with rats. They were wild, bold, ravenous, their red eyes glaring up upon me as if they waited, but for motionless on my part, to make me their prey. To what food, I thought, have they been accustomed in the well? They had devoured, in spite of all my efforts to prevent them, all but a small remnant of the contents of the dish. In the voracity of the vermin, 
frequently fastened their sharp fangs on my fingers. With the pestles of the oily and spicy bed, which now remained, I thoroughly rubbed the bandage wherever I could reach it, and then raising my hand from the floor, I lay breathlessly still. At first, the ravenous animals were startled, terrified at the change. At the cessation of movement, they shrank alarmedly back. Many sought the well, but this was only for a moment. I had not counted in vain upon their veracity. Observing that I remained without motion, one or two of the boldest leaped upon the framework and smelt of the surgical. This seemed the signal for a general rush. Forth from the well they hurried their fresh troops. They clung to the wood, they overran it, and leaped in hundreds upon my person. I endured in vain. At length I felt that I was free. The surgical hung in ribbons from my body. But the stroke of the pendulum already pressed upon my bosom. At a wave of my hand, my deliverers hurried tumultuously away. With steady movement, cautious, sidelong, shrinking, and slow, I slid from the embrace of the bandage and beyond the reach of the hammer. For the moment, at least, I was free. Free and in the grasp of the Inquisition. I had scarcely stepped from my wooden bed of horror upon the stone floor of the prison when the motion of the hellish machine ceased and I beheld it drawn up by some invisible force to the ceiling. This was a lesson in which I took desperately to heart. My every motion was undoubtedly watched. Free. I had but escaped death in one form of agony to be delivered into worse than death in some other. With that thought, I rolled my eyes nervously around the barriers of iron that hemmed me in. Something unusual, some change which at first I could not appreciate distinctly, it was obvious, had taken place in the apartment. I had observed that, although the outlines of the figures upon the walls were sufficiently distinct, yet the colors seemed blurred and indefinite. These colors had now assumed, and were momentarily assuming, a startling and most intense brilliancy that gave to the spectral and fiendish portraitures the aspect that might have thrilled even firmer nerves than my own. Demon eyes, a wild and ghastly vivacity, glared upon me in a thousand directions, where none had been visible before, and gleamed with the lurid luster of a fire that I could not force my imagination to regard as unreal. Unreal? Even while I breathed, there came to my nostrils the breath of the vapor of heated iron. A suffocating odor pervaded the prison. I panted. I gasped for breath. 
There could be no doubt of the design of my tormentors. Oh, the most unrelenting, oh, most demonic of men. I shrank from the glowing metal to the center of the cell. Amid the thought of the fiery destruction that impended, the idea of the coolness of the well over my soul like balm, I rushed to its deadly brink. I threw my straining vision below. The glare from the enkindled roof illuminated its innermost recesses. Yet, for a wild moment did my spirit refuse to comprehend the meaning of what I saw. At length, it forced. It wrestled its way into my soul. It burned itself upon my shuddering reason. Oh, for a voice to speak, oh, horror. Oh, any horror but this with a shriek. I rushed from the margin and buried my face in my hands, weeping bitterly. The heat rapidly increased, and once again I looked up, shuddering as if with a fit of the og. There seemed to be a second change in the cell, and now the change was obviously in the form. The room had been square. I saw that the two of this iron angles were now acute, two consequently obtuse. The fearful difference quickly increased with a low rumbling or moaning sound. In an instant, the apartment had shifted its form into that of the Martians. But the alteration stopped not here. I neither hoped nor desired it to stop. I could have clasped the red walls to my bosom as a garment of eternal peace. Death, I said any death, but that of the pit, fool. Might I have not known that into the pit it was the object of the burning iron to urge me? Could I resist its blow? Or if even that, could I withstand its pressure? And now, flatter and flatter, blew the large orange. With a rapidity that left me no time for contemplation, its center, and of course its greatest width, came just over the yawning gulf. I shrank back, but the closing walls pressed me resistlessly onward. At length, for my seared and writhing body, there was no longer an inch of foothold on the firm floor of the prison. I struggled no more, but the agony of my soul found vent in one loud, long, and final scream of despair. I felt that I tottered upon the brink I averted my eyes. There was a discordant hum of human voices. There was a loud blast of many trumpets. There was a harsh grating of a thousand thunders. The firing walls rushed back and outstretched arm caught my own as I fell fainting into the abyss. What was that a gentleman's The French army had entered Toledo. The Inquisition.